The smoke oil tank is situated in the rear cockpit. As you can see, it's a fairly large tank. It holds 35 US gallons of uh, biodegradable oil. The oil travels down a complicated series of valves into the plane's exhaust, where it burns and then comes out as dense smoke. Gentlemen, welcome to the briefing. The operation is planned with military precision, down to the last letter, you could say. The messages must be perfectly formed in less than 90 seconds, and they could be up to 25 letters long. Hope there are no spelling mistakes. By the time they take off, they've already planned their exact flight path. And if they're flying through controlled airspace, their journey must be cleared by air traffic control. One by one, the squadron take to the skies in their 1930s Harvard aircraft. They're perfect for the job because their exhausts are larger than most planes, so they'll blow out more smoke much more quickly. One last check from John, and everyone's up, ready to write. For this mission, five planes fly in parallel formation, two either side of the lead plane. During the flight, the lead pilot uses the latest laptop technology to program the message into the smoke control systems of the other planes. He checks a message on this screen in the cockpit. Last chance for a spell check. The computer relays the instructions to the other four planes via a series of radio signals, which are sent to these receivers. They control the smoke sequences spurting out of the plane's exhausts. So each pilot knows that his part of the message will come out in perfect short bursts and in the right order. There's also a 70-meter gap between each plane to make sure the letters are the right size and in correct proportion. Usually, water vapor in the air will dissolve smoke within seconds, but at this height, 10,000 feet, there's not a drop of moisture, and the smoky messages can stay visible for up to 20 minutes. So hopefully, the message is clear. That's how they did it. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to present someone most of the power. When a volcano blows, it hurls millions of tons of ash into the atmosphere, and the red hot lava steaming down its sides can kill tens of thousands of people. For centuries, volcanic eruptions have taken the world by surprise. But when Loki in Iceland erupted, no one died because warning had been given by some very special people. Volcanic eruptions and earthquakes are going to always happen. And there's nothing we can do to control them or stop them. But it is possible to predict when a volcano is going to erupt. And how do they do that? They use one of these, a seismometer. Uh, it consists of a mass on a spring, and when the ground moves, that can set the mass shaking. An electrical coil senses that motion, the ground moves and generates an electric signal. Bruce and Jill are seismologists. By planting a seismometer on the bedrock, they can detect the shaking going on under the Earth's surface, no matter how big or how small. And by connecting it to their laboratory nearby, they can turn the electrical signals into squiggles on a chart. The bigger the shake, the bigger the signal, the bigger the squiggle. These charts tell them exactly what's going on deep inside our planet. How do we know what's at the center of the Earth? We asked the little guys who've been there, and who are they, and they're the seismic waves. Seismic waves travel around the globe, using the Earth's surface like a sounding board. So seismologists can pick up these waves, even if the shaking that causes them happens on the other side of the world. Early in the history of seismology, they would record these things, and they didn't know what they were. It was a long time before two and two was put together with newspapers from the other side of the world, and they realized they were seeing earthquakes that far away. 
both volcanoes and earthquakes take place because the earth we stand on isn't really as solid as we'd like to think. It's full of gigantic cracks or fissures. In fact, the surface of the earth is divided up into giant plates, each constantly moving. On these we find volcanoes and earthquakes, but we only notice when a big shift occurs. The seismometer records lots of different waves beneath the Earth's surface, but Bruce and Jill know which come from the volcano they're studying. How? Well, the answer's in the strength of the waves, and that's measured on something called the Richter scale. When this earthquake struck in Kobe, Japan, it registered 7.2 on the Richter scale. That's a small-sounding number for an awful lot of destruction. So how do seismologists work out what number to give an earthquake? Well, they measure two things, the height of the wave on the chart and how long the shaking actually lasted. Then they draw a line that joins these two measurements on a graph, and where that line crosses the Richter scale on the graph marks the quake strength. But each step up the scale represents a huge increase in the forces released. Every time you go up one step in like from four to five or five to six, the strength of the ground shaking, or the amount of energy involved, goes up by a factor of about 30. That's a factor of 30. So as you just go up this scale from 4 to 5 to 6 to 7 to 8, you aren't getting something twice as big. You're getting something a million times bigger. They know what sort of waves to expect from a volcano close to erupting, so they screen out the other waves and watch for telltale signals. It's very common for there to be intense seismic activity in many earthquakes for a week or two before a volcano erupts. And it's also common for these earthquakes to migrate systematically toward the volcano and toward the surface. As molten lava pushes upwards under the surface, the earth tremors get stronger and closer to the dormant volcano. Bruce and Jill know when this is happening because the seismic waves tell them. Hard. If a seismic wave had traveled through, uh, say, molten rock, you'd expect it to be slowed down by trying to get through all this gooey stuff. And um, so when you measured it the time of arrival at the seismometer, you'd see it was later than you expected. As the signals change in frequency, they can work out how close the lava is to the surface and therefore how long it will be before the volcano erupts. So Bruce and Jill can tell us when a volcano is getting dangerous. And they're working on the next big breakthrough, being able to predict when an earthquake is on its way. Predicting big earthquakes, that would be very nice, but we haven't cracked that one yet. That's the holy grail of seismology. But for now, thanks to seismologists like Bruce and Jill, people all over the world would at least have time to escape from the fury of volcanic eruptions. Maya, so if I, if I say mush to you, right, mm -hmm. what does it make you think of? Mush, mm, mush. Lick my lips. I think it's got to be peas, fish and chips. No, me. no, 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 no. Not mushy. Mush, oh, you know, oh. you know, in, in colder climes, that's mm -hmm. what you say to husky dogs. You know, husky dogs mush when you want them to, <laughs> to get that old sled moving, you know. Okay. But uh, what I've always wondered is how do you persuade all those dogs to pull the sled, to do it together, to pull it in the right direction? Have you wondered that too? Well, here's how. When things get really cold, man turns to his best friend, the dog. And the husky dog is only too happy to help out in temperatures of minus 40 degrees centigrade, which is why the Inuit have relied on huskies for over 2,000 years, and explorers too. In fact, without huskies, we would never have reached the North or the South Poles. Huskies are strong, hard-working animals that can easily run 30 miles a day pulling loads of up to three times their own weight. In fact, huskies love running so much, it was only a matter of time before someone thought of letting them race. And in places like Alaska, they've been doing just that since the turn of the century. In Britain, we don't have very much snow. We don't have very many huskies either. But even so, men like John Evans are able to race them. I first got into husky racing when we found out that there was a club being formed to work the dogs and uh, as soon as we'd seen them being worked and took part in the event we were hooked. It's such a, an enjoyable experience and it's obviously what the dogs have been bred for for so long. They love it. 
Here at Avermore in the Scottish Highlands, husky owners from all over Europe meet once a year for racing. Their dogs are well suited to the rugged conditions. Things that make Siberian Husky special compared to many other breeds is that they have quite long eyelashes. This is to help keep the snow out. One unusual feature is that the nose dries at night to stop it freezing. The ears are very ha hairy once again because uh, it's to stop the snow going in. Um, with the coat, I've deliberately left this dog ungroomed so I can show you that it has a twin coat. This is the waterproof outer coat, which is quite rough. And then underneath, you've got this incredible down layer, which is where they keep the warmth in. As cute and cuddly as they might look, huskies are not pet dogs, and they are never let off their leashes. They are direct descendants of the wolf, and they can still hear the call of the wild. Even so, their owners can get them racing like a team of professionals. How do they do that? Well, because huskies are easy to train, and they have a natural urge to pull things. There we go. Come on. Walk on. Walk on. Come on. Good boy. Come on, then. Good boy. With the Siberian Husky, the instinct to pull is always there. All you need to do is to go onto the physical side to actually build them up physically by proper anaerobic exercise every other day and then we race at weekends. Huskies are popular with explorers because they'll eat almost anything and still have the energy to work hard. But when it comes to racing, these athletes are given special treatment. Basically, they're all fed a high-protein dog diet. But because it's exercising a lot, it needs to be able to turn it into energy quickly. British racing huskies wouldn't be seen dead on the track without their designer trainers. Their feet need protection when there's no snow on the ground, but without that vital white stuff, how can you race huskies? Well, they use a specially built rig with bicycle wheels, which replaces the traditional sled. The order in which the team is hitched to the rig makes all the difference between winning and losing. At the back are the wheel dogs, older, heavier, and able to provide the real pulling power. The second row are called point dogs, good constant runners. Then, leading the pack are the sprinters, the Linford Christies of the team. We like to mix amongst our lead dogs quite a lot to give each dog an opportunity because it's more fun to run at the front. Three, two, one, go! The races run over a spectacular seven-mile course. A fast Husky rig can complete it in around 36 minutes. Speeding through the forest at over 20 miles an hour behind a team of hunting dogs could be dangerous. After all, this isn't like the wide open spaces of the Arctic. There are trees and sharp rocks to consider. Even so, the huskies turn left and right to order. How do the drivers do this? Answer, they use Eskimo language. The commands that we use are very simple. We've got G for right, haw for left. We don't use right and left because to a dog the pronunciation is very similar, whereas we're told that G and haw is very different. High con, or you can shout rhubarb and custard to get them going, because they just love to go. And then you've got lots of commands to make them stop. They don't work at all. They keep running, probably even faster. Like all true athletes, Huskies won't stop until they cross the finishing line, preferably in first place. The real enjoyment that I get is to go out with my own dogs quietly sometimes and just run out with them and train with them because I just, it's just such a pleasant experience. Until you've done it, it's so hard to comprehend, but it is just very nice. And what if Husky Power hit the big city? It would sure beat taking a bus. Well, that's the show for tonight. Thanks for all your letters. Do keep safe.